welcome back to the Graham Stephan Show. So I think it's a really important idea that we hear out other perspectives, uh, maybe some things that we disagree with, and have an open discussion about the things that uh, tend to trigger us. And with that, brings me to this video here by the Young Turks. Now, for those unaware, they're a channel where they are very for the most part, anti-capitalism, anti-homeowner. There's a lot of things in there that we are complete opposites about. Now, uh, for those that are unaware, for me, I'm a real estate guy from the very beginning. It was what I first started doing when I was 18 years old. I got my real estate license. I started investing in property in 2011. And since then, I've scaled up and uh, they disagree with that. And I wanna show you from this video here, okay? It's just titled, The Airbnb Bust is Teaching Rich People a Hard Lesson in Capitalism. And even though I've never done Airbnb myself, everything I do is very much long-term rentals, I do think this is going to open up an interesting, heated discussion as soon as you hit the like button and subscribe, because I have a feeling it's gonna be a doozy. So with that said, thank you so much, and now, Let's begin. Two years ago, I bought a house in Palm Springs and renovated it. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, you guys. It, we lost money. We, uh, it's not looking good. So here's the funny thing with news, uh, or really any sort of media, is that they tend to take things and they clip it up and they take the one thing out of context. And then they say, oh, look at that. She lost money. That is bad. The Airbnb bust, she deserves it. She's a millennial trying to make money off the housing market. That is bad. But what's remarkable is that uh, you know once you zoom out a little bit, you realize that she's made money in some of the higher earning months and then loses money during some of the lower earning months. And the high months make up for the low months. Crazy concept, right? Well, this is basically exactly that. If you watch Shelby Church's video, she says that this is a little bit more of the off-peak times. She'll lose money there, but she'll make it up in, in other bookings elsewhere. And that over the year, It'll equal out unless she has a big expense coming up as like a one-time thing. And then, yeah, it's going to eat into the cash flow, just like almost any other seasonal business. And when you're renting in Palm Springs, it's very much a seasonal business. But you know what? Watch them run with it because they're going to go on this and they're going to say, oh, look, Airbnb is bad. But I'll show you the unbiased truth on this because I don't do Airbnb, but I do try to find the neutral picture. So... With that said, you can tell this will be a juicy one. We'll, we'll keep watching. Their bookings have gone down considerably. In some cases, not a single booking for the rest of the year. Now, what's going on? Hmm, maybe the uh, market might be oversaturated with short-term rentals. <laughs> I find it very hard to believe that someone would have no bookings the entire year. If that's the case, their pictures are crap. If that's the case, they're overpriced, and they have to be more competitive. It's a business, just like anything else. If you're a business and you have no customers, why do you have no customers? Bad marketing, you don't show your value, or you're overpriced. It's one of those three things. So I say from that, it's not really the full case. There, there are plenty of places that have plenty of bookings. Uh, case in point, just look at the actual data from Airbnb. They said that overall, their bookings increased 19% to $20.4 billion in the first quarter from a year earlier. That's also in line with a 19% increase in nights and experiences bookings to 121 million. So that right there shows you that even though there's more competition, Airbnb is still doing decently well. Hopefully they're not over leveraged and they don't lose those homes. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, I, I know, I, I know, I'm being super giddy and like ridiculous about it, but I can't help it. Ah, uh, it's just like, I feel like it, it's such in bad taste to rejoice in anyone's downfall or even hope that they fail so much as to lose money. Because to me, it's very much like a destructive mentality that like you feel better about yourself watching other people fail. When in reality, I mean, your failure, your success is no bearing on what someone else is doing that you don't even know. So now we have this oversaturation of these short-term rentals and the people who invested their money in it, hoping for some passive income, aren't getting it. Ugh, oh, oh, it's just, it's the attitude I have a problem with. It's just that passive income, the passive income. It's just like, come on, again, it's like, the real issue here is that the Fed lowered interest rates to such a minuscule amount that oversaturated the economy with a ton of money. What do you expect people to do? Any fiscally smart person would just see the writing on the wall and think, I wanna lock in a low interest rate mortgage because this is a once in a lifetime thing. All of a sudden, I could buy the property that I never thought I'd be able to afford. At the same time as doing that, 
People were saying the real estate market was going to crash. People did not think that was gonna last for any amount of time. So anyone who buys a property takes the risk that maybe there's a chance they lock an interest rate, the housing values plummet, that they don't make any money whatsoever. And that's, and that's a part of any investment is that you get paid in direct proportion to the amount of risk that you take. It's not so much as like, oh, you wanna get passive income. It's the fact that the Fed printed trillions of dollars. They artificially lowered interest rates to a point where anyone with money in the sidelines who wants to invest in real estate, this became a once in a lifetime event to buy real estate. Very few people out there just like, oh, I wanna buy passive income. And start just like mindlessly buying properties. They're not getting any income right now. Because again, the market is oversaturated. So let me give you some more details. Uh, no, no, not yet, not yet. Oh, so this all- Why is she interrupting the guy? I'm sure the other guy is trying to like rationalize with her and be like, hey, maybe they're not, maybe they're making some income. I mean, the fact is, if you have a property, you're gonna have some income. You're not gonna, you're not gonna make nothing. It just, it doesn't happen. Sure, you might be cash flow negative, but then you think, am I making the money up with mortgage interest every month? Is the property going up in value? Do I owe more in the home than what it's worth? Am I positive? There's so many ways to calculate the cash flow in a rental property and any property's not gonna make zero. It's it just, that's impossible. There's someone who's always gonna pay something for it. He says that uh, his property in Desert Hot Springs, California dropped from 80% occupancy to 0% this past month and hasn't rebounded since. Quote, we haven't had a single booking since June, he says. Yeah, but here's the thing, okay? Like June is not a prime month in Palm Springs. And I will say, Palm Springs is a bit of an anomaly in terms of the overall market. It's like the Young Turks are pointing to this one location, a very tiny location compared to the overall United States and saying, oh, this place is not doing well. Therefore, the entirety of the housing market is doomed. It's Palm Springs. So Palm Springs, for those unaware, what they've done is they've started limiting Airbnb rentals. Uh, so they don't want a whole bunch of Airbnbs there. So now they've implemented a bit of a uh, permit system where to go and operate an Airbnb legally, you have to go through a permitting system, get approved, and then you could legally do it. And yeah, there are people out there who just don't legally do it. They just go around it and they, they figure they, you know, the fine is gonna be cheaper than the revenue they'd lose out on if they don't get the permit. But overall, Palm Springs, yes, has seen a decline in bookings. Although you could also see in other locations that uh, Phoenix, Austin, Texas, Myrtle Beach, San Antonio, Nashville, Airbnb revenue is down substantially. But then you have other areas like Fairbanks, Alaska, where the average property generates $49,000 in average revenue. The thing is, when you start looking at this data, you'll realize that for Airbnb bookings, they exploded, they went up so much from 2021 to 2022. So when something goes up that much and sees a decline, a lot of that could just be returning to normalcy. Because again, if something goes up 500% in a year, and then all of a sudden it's down by 50%, you could look at that and say, oh wow, it's down 50% in the last year. Yeah, but it's still up 250% from two years ago. So it's really when you start looking at all the data that you start to see that you know one little data set doesn't say the entire thing without really getting into the weeds of it. Now they're thinking about either selling the properties or doing long-term you know, normal rentals for people who need housing, which means it could increase the supply of rental properties on the market and that could lower the price of rentals if things work out the way they're supposed to in an economy where things don't seem to make much sense more and more every day. What? I mean, okay, so her logic is, in my opinion, uh, mostly right on that, okay? So here's the thing also when you look at Airbnb, I forgot to mention this earlier, but when you look at Airbnb revenue and you say, oh, Airbnb revenue is down by 50%, let's just say, okay? They're also facing increased competition from VRBO, Booking.com, and going direct. A lot of these houses now say, I don't wanna pay Airbnb their fees. Instead, I'm gonna make my property a website, 123fakestreet.com, and people could just go there, book directly with me, and then all of a sudden, cut out Airbnb. That'll show less revenue. If Airbnb has more competition on VRBO, that'll show less revenue. A lot of things that go into that. But yeah, she is right. The more supply that comes on the market, the more people that can't rent on Airbnb or just are tired of it, because it's a grind. What they're gonna do is list their property up for a long-term rental. So when they do that, yes, more inventory will come on the market. 
if so many rentals are out there, all of a sudden that drives down the price. I think that's true. I've been, I've been saying that for a long time. I believe that a lot of owners who lock in very low mortgage rates, they're not going to want to sell. But what happens when they want to move out of the house into something else? Well, they're not just going to keep the home empty. What they're going to do is put it up on the market for rent. And a lot of people are doing that. I've seen in Vegas. Prices are down probably 25% give or take on rentals because so many people bought a property, low interest rate, they don't want to get rid of it, so instead they rent it. Everyone's doing the same thing. Demand goes down, there aren't enough renters to take the houses, so they lower their prices. That's happening. But the thing is, those people are so cash flow positive on the properties because they have such a low interest rate, they don't care. As long as they just break even on the mortgage payment, get a great tenant, they do not care. So from my perspective, that's what's going on, at least here in Las Vegas. The people who really get screwed are the ones who bought at the top of the market as a rental property, and all of a sudden, they can't generate enough to pay the mortgage and the overhead expenses. Like, renting is cheaper in Las Vegas than it is to buy something. Buy about 30%, that's remarkable. So from that perspective, she is right. Now the owners are attaching all sorts of conditions, right? They give you a cleaning fee, all right, I can live with a cleaning fee. I get it. You got to clean up the place, right? Then they started jacking up the cleaning fee, and I was like, yeah. This. Yeah, I know. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. So, uh, just anecdotally here, and just kind of from what I've seen online, uh, from other people who have the same experience and thought as me, the cleaning fees are atrocious. I think Airbnb owners have somewhat seen that they could sneak some, you know, high Airbnb cleaning fees into the into the whole experience and make a profit from that. I've heard firsthand of people who are like, yeah, I pay the cleaner 60 bucks, but I'm gonna charge $200 and I make a profit on the cleaning. I just pass it on. Like uh, sometimes even, it's a marketing thing. Like when you look at a property, instead of saying, oh, this, this property costs $300 a night. No, the property costs $99 a night, but there's a $200 cleaning fee. It's like crap like that. The other thing that I don't like about Airbnb is that sometimes you just want the good customer service of having someone at your beck and call, concierge, room service, all that sort of stuff that you that you don't get with an Airbnb. So I kind of get it, but yeah, the cleaning fees, horrible. Absolutely horrible. Charge a flat 50 bucks and call it a day. Well, basically clean the entire property and pay a cleaning fee, which, but why? Why would we do that? Yeah. But that's a little bit of a separate issue, but I, I can imagine that no, it's no, playing it's not into a separate the problem. Issue. Oh, okay, okay, okay yeah. Jake. Keeps interrupting him, bothers me. It's like he's finishing a sentence and she'll just boom. Right there, and he just towers back. I mean, it's like this giant list of things you have to do, right? And I'm like, I was going on vacation. I wasn't going to be your goddamn butler. <laughs> like, what the hell is this, right? Yeah, okay, so I had one Airbnb uh, in Nashville. Great experience overall, but yeah, there was a laundry list of stuff that we had to do before we left. And if that stuff wasn't done, they threatened like, you know, we might have to charge you in excess of this. They wanted me to like start doing the dishes, take out the trash, do certain things, unplug certain things. I mean, you know, it wasn't the, the end of the world. I didn't mind doing it, it took like 10 minutes. Uh, oh, take all the uh, bedding off of the bed, uh, put all the dirty laundry or use towels and all that like in a corner so someone could get it. And I get it, you know, all this stuff is helpful. I understand, but it shouldn't be necessarily like the new norm where all of a sudden the guest has to start doing some of the house cleaning themselves, okay? That's what I'm getting at. It's the entitlement mindset you would expect from someone who wants to like just sit around and collect passive income, yeah. right? There is no such thing as passive income. That, it's, it's all a dream, right? Unless you're invested in stocks and they pay you dividends. Yeah, but see the thing is, it's like why isn't she upset at people buying into the stock market? She's saying, it's like she's upset at these homeowners for like buying properties for passive income. But meanwhile, stock prices have increased so much since 2020. And why was she not looking at that and being, well, now stocks are unaffordable to the average person who wants to begin investing in the market and maybe the returns that they could have gotten had they done that, you know, but they didn't. It's interesting to me how it's just isolated to housing. And yes, I get people live in houses, they can't live in stocks, I understand that. But from an investment standpoint, you would think that the two should be treated somewhat equally in terms of their appreciation, which mostly money printing, low interest rates. That's really what it comes down to. The investor is just a symptom of much bigger issues in the economy that are outside of everyone's control. When you're doing an Airbnb, you gotta go get the thing, you gotta set it up, you gotta arrange this, you gotta arrange that, Unless and then when you have to do it, then you're like, oh my god, I don't wanna do that, I just want it to be passive income. I don't think anyone's buying an Airbnb just expecting to sit on their butt all day. I don't know anyone who's gone into it and been surprised that there's work involved. 
any landlord will tell you there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. And sure, some months could be zero hours. Other months, it could be like you're working another full-time job, trying to get the rental property up and running, meeting with contractors, doing a lot of it yourself. You know what? It's not something that you buy for passive income. And unless, like she said, dividend stocks, okay, maybe. But then you run the risk of the stock going down, at least with housing, you have more control over it. Unless you expect the people renting your short-term rental to do all the work for you, which yes. is what's been going on. No, <laughs> I know, but- Gideon's very happy about this. I would love for her to manage an Airbnb for like a month and just see what it's like. Try it firsthand and then you could say, it's, it's not for me. I, I, I dare her. I dare her to do that. Am I supposed to cry for you when you won't lower the prices? I'm not crying for that. I love how she had to throw that in there. I'm not crying for him. Yeah, we, we know. We deduced that. Uh, I have a feeling you, you're you gonna go home and celebrate this. I get to charge as much as I want, but if things go south, no, I'm still charging as much as I want. No, it's called supply and demand. You know what's crazy though, is that they never mentioned that landlords were the ones subsidizing tenants who weren't paying throughout COVID. That's something, that's something that's never happened before, is that all of a sudden, if a tenant couldn't pay, the government was not saying, oh, we'll pay the rent. The government basically just said, well, landlords, you can't charge rent. You can't evict a non-paying tenant because COVID and it's a health risk. So you have to eat the cost. Well, imagine if the same thing were to be said about any other service, like car repairs. Let's say uh, someone needs a car to go to and from work and they said, you know what? That auto mechanic needs to fix that person's car because it's a health risk and if they don't get to work, our economy is gonna shut down and they have to bear the cost of it. Or groceries, imagine grocery stores. They didn't just give out free food because the government said people need to eat, so therefore grocery stores need to subsidize. Landlords were the only ones that had to subsidize the tenants for three, it was three years for me that I could not raise any rents on any tenant in the city of Los Angeles. Three years, even though my costs have gone up substantially from insurance, property taxes, repairs, finding a handyman that could go and actually do something doubled, but I can't raise the rent. Okay, fine. So, so be it. But you also couldn't evict a tenant who didn't pay for three years. Thankfully, I did not have an instance where a tenant stopped paying rent or we ever got to that point. But I can't imagine that if I was owning a property, maybe that I had bought 10 years ago or something like that, that I used to live in and I kept it in the family and I still have a mortgage on it and I moved somewhere else and I got a tenant in there and then all of a sudden the tenant stops paying the rent for three years? Where all of a sudden I gotta pay the mortgage, property taxes, insurance, or I get my home foreclosed on. How does that make sense? So, you know, it doesn't go both ways. I feel like it's fair to mention that as well. Many US Airbnbs are sitting empty because so many wealthier people and investors listed short term rentals on the site in the wake of a pandemic fueled boom. The number of available short-term rental listings in the US skyrocketed to 1.38 million in September. Again, it was the same thing like I mentioned earlier. It's, it's only because things have gone up so much that we see any sort of decline and it looks dramatic year over year. But again, when you zoom out more than that, it's not that bad. I mean, bookings are still higher than what they were in 2019. So I, I, I don't see the, the issue in the big picture there. It's just business has boomed so much because of COVID that it's normalizing. From my perspective, this is what I see. I mean, we see conversations online where people are like fighting each other over, are you a NIMBY or a YIMBY? And are we building enough house? Like the housing exists. It's just that the housing has been snatched up by people looking for passive income. <laughs> like it's insane. No, I, listen, I think there's definitely an investment component to it, but at the core, it's like any economy will start to level itself out. When there's so much demand, builders will start building. But the issue is that builders can't build fast enough because of restrictions, zoning, and flat out getting materials. We're still in a bit of a supply chain crisis where they, they can't get enough materials to build the homes at a price that makes sense because prices have gone up so much, they have to charge more. Or the only properties worth building are the ones where they can make more money on them that happen to be really expensive. I think it's a fundamental issue with the entire country that we should be able to build more homes for cheaper, and find a way to do that. You can't say I want the upsides of capitalism, but I don't want the downsides of capitalism, okay? And if the market goes down, I demand my profit be protected. That's not a thing, it's not a thing. You lower the prices. Except, by the way, in COVID, where landlords had to subsidize tenants for years. Even if the landlords couldn't afford it, they've had to find a way to afford it. There's no mani-pedi for you. Mm. <laughs>
Mm. You can't like be like, yeah, free market, and then go, oh no, free market, somebody protect me. I don't think anyone's doing that. Poor Shelby though, I feel bad for her because her intro was taken so far out of context. It's like, yeah, a bad month and off peak seasons, that's the way it goes. I have a buddy of mine who does a lot of short-term rentals in Yosemite. That's the way it works. Some months, it's not busy. Other months, it's really busy that makes up for those low months. This is kind of how it works. So let me know what your thoughts are down below in the comments section. And also, how about this? Uh, if this upset you, I got something to make it a little better with some free stocks down below in the description because I got a paid affiliate link there and that could be worth all the way up to a few thousand dollars when you make a deposit. Enjoy, also feel free to subscribe, hit the like button, add me Snapchat, Instagram, all that great stuff. Thank you so much and until next time.